Hey there. Today we're going to talk about something really important and unfortunately all too common, stalking. It's not just about someone following you or sending you unwanted messages. It's a serious crime that can deeply affect its victims. We'll be looking at two cases that really bring this issue to light. The harrowing ordeal of Mary Stoffer and Ming Sen Shu and the disturbing fixation of Dawn at Night on Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones. These cases show just how serious and complex stalking can be and the impact it can have on the lives of those involved. Through these stories, we'll get a glimpse into the experiences of the victims and the challenges they faced. It's a chance for us to learn more about the realities of stalking and how we can better support those who have been affected by it. So, stay tuned as we dive into these cases and explore this important topic together. Mary Stauffer and Ming Sen Shiwu. On May 16, 1980, Mary Stauffer and her daughter Beth, who was eight years old, were leaving a beauty shop in Roseville, Minnesota when a man who had a gun pulled them into his car. At the time, Mary didn't recognize him, but she soon found out that he had been in her high school math class 15 years before. That ex-student was Ming Sen Shu, who was 29 years old and had become dangerously obsessed with Stauffer. He had been following her family around and tried to abduct her at least four times before the day he was able to force Mary Stauffer and her daughter into his car. Right after the kidnapping at gunpoint, when things started to go badly for the mother and daughter, she told Stauffer to drive his car to a remote area and park it there. Then he tied Mary and Beth's hands together and threw them into the trunk of his car. Before he could drive, he stopped the car and opened the trunk to tell them they were praying too loudly. He put duct tape over their mouths and kept driving. When he stopped, he opened the trunk again and saw that Mary had partly freed her daughter. He got angry about this and started making threats against them. Two boys saw something strange going on. They looked in the trunk and saw Mary and Beth. One of them said, Whoa! She threw the boy, Scott Wilkman, six years old, into the trunk and drove off before he could say anything else. When she stopped the car again, he took Wilkman out of the trunk, hit him over the head with a metal rod, and then dumped his body in the woods. The police didn't find Wilkman's body until after they caught Shu. Shu locked Mary and Beth in a room that was 21 inches wide and 4 feet long when he got home in Roseville. The next day, Shu tied Mary up in the living room and told her he used to be her math teacher. He also told her that he had been looking for a long time. Five years ago, she broke into the home of her in-laws in Duluth, Minnesota, because he thought she lived there. He got a gun, tied up her in-laws, and told them he would kill them if they told anyone about the break-in. Then, in 1979, he found out that Mary was living in an apartment in St. Paul at Bethel University, where her husband worked. The case file for State 5. Ming Sen Xu says he tried to break into the flat three times, and at least once, he tried to drill holes in the floor under Mary's bed. He started to rape Mary every day after he abducted her. He recorded the assaults, which went on for hours at a time. He once tried to smother Beth until Mary kissed him on the lips to stop him. He was mad that Mary wasn't showing him love during these assaults. Mary and Beth finally got away on July 7. Mary broke the door open and called the cops from Shu's phone, even though she was tied to her daughter. She told them who she was and where she was. Then, with her daughter still chained to her, she went outside to hide until the police came, which took a few minutes. There were two cases after she was arrested one for the kidnapping of Mary and Beth Stauffer by the federal government, and one for the murder of Jason Wilkman by the state government. She was found guilty in both cases and given two sentences to be served at the same time. 
30 years to life for the federal kidnapping charge and 40 years for the state murder charge. He was first available for parole in 2010, but he is still in jail. How is Mary doing today, though? Lifetime showed the drama abducted. The Mary Stauffer story on October 5, 2019, which was based on a crime that happened 40 years ago. Mary Stauffer told Lifetime that it was important for her to share her story and that there were times when she had doubts about her faith. She tells him, we pray for you. We didn't hate him, but we did hate what he did. Mary says that being through what she did doesn't define her and she and her husband were able to finish their mission work and retire. They're glad to see their kids get married and have kids of their own. Beth Stoffer says, he didn't get to blow up our lives. He messed up his life. Donette Knight and Michael Douglas. When Donette Knight developed an obsession with Fatal Attraction star Michael Douglas, his wife Catherine Zeta-Jones got caught in the crossfire. Knight wrote Douglas several letters in which she said she was his lover and that she wanted to cut up his wife Catherine and feed them to her dogs. There has never been a more dangerous draw than that. Knight was eventually charged with stalking and given a three-year prison term, which wasn't a surprise. After being born in 1962, Knight's life seemed to go as it should have. As she became an adult, though, her mental health started to get worse. Like many others, she became deeply obsessed with Michael Douglas after seeing him in the movie Fatal Attraction. However, Knight thought that she and Douglas were meant to be together, even though they had never met. Knight quickly became fixated on Douglas, and she started to think that his wife, Catherine Zeta-Jones, was getting in the way of their love. Knight's behavior became more and more crazy because of this delusion. In 2003, she started writing threatening letters to Zeta Jones. There were unsettling things in the letters, like violent descriptions and death threats against Zeta Jones and her family. After coming across a tabloid's claim of an affair involving Catherine, the stalker sent more than 20 threatening letters to the actress. She also allegedly made repeated calls to Catherine's agents and the couple's hotel. Knight's messages went to Zeta Jones directly and to several news sites, where she talked about her fantasies about Douglas and her desire to wipe Zeta Jones out of the picture. Zeta Jones was understandably very scared and upset by these threats. She had to live her whole life worrying about her safety and the safety of her family and friends. In her victim impact statement, Catherine said, this woman is not insane. She is simply evil. This person was very articulate about how she was going to kill me. You have profoundly affected me and how I conduct my life from the first time I was aware of this nightmare. Your actions will be with me for the rest of my life. How I will be constantly observing, looking over my shoulder, as a result of their probe, the FBI was able to link the letters to Knight. In June 2004, Knight was arrested and charged with stalking Zeta Jones and making threats to hurt her. During her trial, it came out that Knight had been labeled with a number of mental illnesses, such as bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. The woman's defense said that her mental illness had a lot to do with what she did and made her think that what she did was okay. Knight was found guilty of stalking and making criminal threats, even though she had mental health problems. She was given 18 years in jail in November 2005. The case brought attention to the risks of being too interested in celebrities and how it can change their lives. Stalking has become a bigger problem in the last few years. Most of the time, it's an unwanted love interest, like a boyfriend or husband who has broken up with you. People who know each other may stalk each other, but so can people who barely or not at all know each other. Stalking is when someone follows, pursues, or bothers another person more than once, 
And by doing this over and over again, the victim starts to think that the stalker will hurt them physically or seriously mentally. A pattern of behavior is a set of two or more actions or events that happen close together in time, even if no one has been convicted of any of them before. An individual can choose to stalk anyone. A lot of the time, stalkers are ex-spouses or partners. A stalker might go after a famous person or public figure, a child, a close friend, or even someone they don't know at all. People who have been stalked say that it has changed how they live. A stalker can get too close by following their target to and from work, school, or social events. A stalker may break in by keeping an eye on the victim's home, calling them repeatedly, or giving them threatening mail. As the victim, what should they do? Call the police. This is the first thing people who are being stalked should do. In the event that they work outside the home, they should let the cops know where they live and where they work. Keep track of things. The person being stalked should keep a full record of every time they see the stalker. Dates, times, locations, full descriptions of the offender, words spoken, actions taken during the event, actions taken afterward, and the names of witnesses should all be in this record of what happened. It's also possible for the target to want to record threats made over the phone or in person. The victim will be able to remember what happened if they need to give information to the police or appear in court if they keep a record. Try to get a protection order. Temporary, emergency, or civil protection orders, the terms of which may vary by state, are court orders that make it illegal for the stalker to have contact with the victim. They are meant to keep the stalker away from the victim. People who break a protection order are usually found guilty of contempt of court and sent to jail or given a fine. That person who breaks a protection order is guilty of a crime, usually a misdemeanor but sometimes a murder, and can be charged with that crime. It is hard to stop stalking, especially if the person doing it is known. The following are some protections or ways to keep bad things from happening. Most of the time, the victim's boss should also be told about the stalking if the victim works outside the home. They may be able to help or even step in. The victim should ideally have a cell phone that they can carry with them. As a way to help stop crime, some programs have started giving stalking victims cell phones that are set to call 911. A temporary or permanent threat alarm system could be put in place at the victim's place of work. When the victims lock their car, they should be very careful and make sure no one is hiding in there before getting in. There may be a need for someone to walk the victim to and from their car if they work outside the home. The victim should never walk alone in the dark or in a remote place during the day or at night. The victim may have a personal alarm gadget with a loud sound that runs on batteries. The victim might want to change the locks on their house or flat. The victim should be told not to carry any kind of deadly tool. If the victim is a woman, she might want to go to a school that teaches self-defense. If the program is done right, it can give the victim a sense of being in charge of their own life. Now, let's talk about support services. Support services for stalking victims are meant to help in many ways because they know how deeply these events affect people's emotions. Therapy and counseling provide a secure and helpful setting for people to work through their emotions, worries, and fears. Not only do these meetings help stalking victims deal with the effects of the stalking right now, but they also teach them long-term ways to take care of their mental health. Support groups help a lot with this because they give people a sense of connection and understanding. Sharing their stories and experiences with others who have been through the same things can help people feel less alone and more able to handle their recovery. Legal help is another important part of the support services that stalking victims can get. If a stalker is bothering them, lawyers can help the victim understand their rights, get protection orders, 
and find their way through the legal system if they decide to go to court against the stalker. Planning for safety is another important part of helping people who are being stalked. Individuals can make safety plans to help them recognize possible dangers and come up with ways to keep themselves safe, both online and off. Crisis intervention services help people deal with their excessive feelings when they are in a very bad situation by giving them support and advice right away. Education and exposure programs are very important for busting stalking myths and making people more aware of how common it is and how bad it is. These programs make the world a safer place for stalking victims by teaching people and experts how to spot the signs and what to do about them. You can also get help and advice from victim assistance services as you go through the recovery process. Advocates work closely with victims to make sure they can get the help and tools they need to heal and get over what happened. These support services work together to give stalking victims a full range of care and help, restoring their sense of safety, control, and well-being. Let's start a conversation about the serious and often misunderstood issue of stalking. Stalking can have a profound impact on its victims, affecting their mental and emotional well-being in profound ways. It's important to raise awareness about the complexities of stalking, including the various forms it can take and the challenges victims face in seeking help and protection. Firstly, what thoughts or feelings do the cases we talked about earlier evoke in you? Have you ever thought about how stalking affects its victims? Or perhaps you have a story or insight you'd like to share? Join the conversation and help raise awareness about this important issue. Your thoughts and experiences can help others understand the severity of stalking and the need for greater support and understanding for those affected. The cases we've explored today, Mary Stauffer and Ming Sen Xiu and Donette Knight and Michael Douglas, underscore the chilling realities of stalking. These stories are a stark reminder of the deep impact stalking can have on individuals and the urgent need for greater awareness and support. Stalking isn't just a minor inconvenience, it's a terrifying ordeal that can shatter lives. Victims often face daunting challenges in seeking help and protection. However, with the right support services, such as therapy, support groups, legal aid, and safety planning, victims can find the strength to heal and rebuild their lives. It's vital that we continue to shine a light on this issue, dispel myths, and offer support to those affected. By sharing these stories, discussing the topic openly, and showing our support, we can create a safer and more understanding world for everyone. We urge you to get involved by sharing your thoughts and experiences, supporting organizations that help stalking victims, and staying informed about resources in your community. Together, we can raise awareness, provide support, and make a real difference in the lives of stalking victims. If you would like to see more videos like this, make sure you like this video and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click the bell button so you can get notified whenever we release a new video. Thanks for watching.